Almost a year ago, I found this device at a thrift store. A work printer XP made by movie staff back in the early 2000s. A machine intended to capture Super 8 films. The footage you are seeing right now was scanned using this apparatus in high definition in 2024. How is that possible? I often talk about treasures that I find at thrift stores. This is an example of why I keep going to those places looking for stuff. I paid $14.99 for this work printer XP. I was not familiar with the machine, but it was obvious that it was a device created to capture film. I did some research and I found the machine required proprietary software. I am familiar with the products of movie staff and I knew they didn't sell the software unless you were the person who bought the machine originally from them. I am aware of what happened with the company, and I have to clarify I am not related to movie staff in any way. The machine is basically a modified gaff projector. I know the basics of electricity, and that was all I needed to figure the device out. As soon as I opened the back cover of the projector, I saw that movie staff installed a switch that activates every time the projector advances one revolution. That's all you need to fire a camera using a remote. At that exact moment, I knew I could use any camera to capture images one by one, no computer or software required. I have to say the modifications are very clever, based on logic and common sense. They created a customized pulley wheel they called the timing disc. The disc has a specific shape that allows the switch to release and click again every time the mechanism of the projector advances one revolution. That means the switch activates every time a new frame is in front of the gate. As its name suggests, the timing disc can be adjusted, so the switch closes the circuit at the exact moment when a new frame is held still in front of the gate. The device was on the market in the early 2000s, before the DSLR revolution. So the machine was designed to work with digital cameras that had a firewire connector, like mini DV and Hi8 cameras. The camera was positioned in front of the massive lens of the work printer XP and captured the image projected from the machine. The mini DV camera acted as a webcam, capturing one picture every time the timing disc activated the switch, triggering the software. I purchased this thing to play with it and tinker. I was not even going to try to buy the software, but I knew I could use a still photo camera and a macro lens to make it work. I used a Nikon D3100 to do the test, and it worked immediately but the image was very dim. So, replacing the LED with a modern, powerful unit with high CRI was the next step. The work printer XP doesn't really project an image. It only illuminates the back of the film so the camera can capture that image. In a way, it is projecting, but the image can be seen by eye because it's way too dim. That's all the camera needs to capture the image anyways. For that reason, they replaced the original bulb with an LED one. The LED of this device was working intermittently. I removed the part and I saw a wire that came loose. I resoldered the wire and the problem was solved. I noticed some weird things while I was checking the part. The person who modified the projector thought it was a good idea to put a piece of CTO or color temperature orange gel in front of the LED. Probably, that person thought warm light would look better in mini TV cameras, and I agree. Those cameras were not great. The last thing you wanted to have was a blue tint on the image. Happily for me, cameras are much better now, so I got rid of the filter. The gel was stealing up to 75% of the light the LED produced. This person also decided to use a diffuser in front of the light, which also steals a good amount of light. The light that comes from the LED gets bounced on a piece of white material before reaching the film. 
I don't know why they thought soft light was needed. It doesn't make any difference. You are just wasting light. It's like illuminating a white piece of paper. If nothing casts a shadow on the paper, it looks the same. I also noticed that the LED was positioned at an angle that matched the small white screen behind the lens, which is positioned at a 45 degree angle with relation to the gate. That was not correct in my opinion. The light had to travel more in some areas, creating an uneven background. I removed the gel and the diffuser and repositioned the light so it's perpendicular to the gate. I also positioned the light much closer to the reflector to take more advantage of it. At that point, the light was much brighter, so I decided not to replace the LED. I was able to see an image using the work printer XP as it was, but I knew since the beginning I wanted to capture the image directly from the film itself. So I eliminated the lens of the projector and the optical device that contained a huge lens and a mirror. I'm sure at the time the lens was helpful, but I knew that every single lens or mirror between the film and the sensor was going to steal light and affect the image in some way. In the end, I had the camera with the macro lens positioned right in front of the film, capturing the image directly from it. The Nikon D3100 has a DX sensor similar to the Super 35 one. I was getting a tiny image in the middle of the frame. I bought a used Panasonic GH3 camera in like new condition for $200 and started using that camera instead. I have had this macro lens for a long time. I bought it for $10 at a thrift store. It's a Vivitar 90mm f2.8 auto telephoto macro with a Nikon mount. It's a great manual lens from the 70s and 80s. It has some chromatic aberration issues. Those issues correct on their own as I close the iris down. The lens has a magnification of 1 to 1. The native ISO of the GH3 is 200. That, combined with the brighter light source, allowed me to set the lens at f11, the sweet spot of the lens. Even when the sensor of the GH3 has a crop factor of 2 times, the small image of the Super 8 projection was far from filling the frame. I tried adding extension tubes to the lens to magnify the image. But at some point, the body of the projector didn't let me put the lens closer to the gate. I can only use one small extension tube, but that helps a bit. The Panasonic GH3 has a teleconverted mode that utilizes only the center of the sensor. This allows for more magnification, almost filling the frame entirely. As usual, everything comes at a cost. That mode can only be used to shoot JPEG images. If I want to shoot in RAW, the teleconverter cannot be used. Even when I'm not able to optically magnify the image to fill the sensor of the GH3, the image I get in post after cropping the edges exceeds the 1080p resolution. More on that later. When I got the projector, I noticed it was running at a speed of 8 frames per second. That was kind of impressive for a device that captured images frame by frame in standard definition. But it was not ideal for my method. One of the reasons for me to use a mirrorless camera was to avoid the vibration a mirror introduces every time it goes up and down. The GH3 not only doesn't have a mirror, but it also has an electronic shutter mode. There is no vibration at all, but the images are more prone to rolling shutter or jelly effect. That was not a problem here, since I was going to capture an image that was not moving. I just had to be careful by adjusting the timing disk so the camera takes the picture when the frame is held still in front of the gate, and by using a relatively fast shutter speed to freeze the image. If I wanted to use the electronic shutter and capture raw images with the GH3, I had to slow the projector down. My extremely basic knowledge of electronics told me I could use a resistor 
to lower the voltage that goes to the motor, slowing it down. My idea was correct, but my calculations didn't work. I gave up on the idea of using a resistor to lower the voltage from the motor, which originally received 5 volts from the power supply. I just added a couple of AA batteries. That slowed the motor down a bit, but not enough. I noticed there was a pulley connecting the motor and the timing disc with a band. I designed and 3D printed a pulley with the smallest possible diameter. That helped me to reduce the speed of the mechanism to about 2.5 frames per second, exactly what I needed. At this point, I just had to find a way to hold the camera in front of the projector. I used some bolts and nuts to create a mechanism that can be adjusted in three axes. I wanted to be able to make fine adjustments in order to align the camera almost perfectly to the sensor. The mechanism worked, but it was just too complicated to align. I decided to use another device I found at another thrift store. This mechanism was created with this intention in mind. And there it was, slowly capturing raw images frame by frame. Projectors are famous for scratching film. When I slowed the projector down, that became less of a problem. Yet, the projector still can cause damage to the sprocket holes and scratch the film, especially if I run the film through it more than once. I scanned film that was fresh out of the lab. Those images were clean. I then rescanned the same film, and there was an increase in the dust specks I saw on the scans. That was expected. Once the images are captured on the SD card, those pictures can be converted into a movie. If I shoot RAW, I have to process the images before creating the sequence. I used Adobe Lightroom to make some adjustments to the pictures. I cropped the image a bit, leaving enough space around it for stabilization. When you send film to a lab, they ask if you want the RAW to be scanned as best light or scene to scene. Having the images in Lightroom allows me to do exactly that. I can adjust the first frame and synchronize the rest of the images to look like that one. Or, I can find the first image of each scene and adjust the first frame of that specific scene and synchronize the rest of the images of that scene to look the same. Once I adjusted the images, I exported them as JPEG. Then, I imported those images as a sequence into Premiere Pro and I had my film ready. Not bad at all for a rudimentary process. I could capture JPEG images in the camera and skip the Lightroom step, by the way. The projector is a very basic device. It doesn't have rails to prevent the film from moving from side to side, so the footage is not perfectly stable. Warp stabilization could help, but it stabilizes the image based on its content, which is not ideal. I imported the images into After Effects and used the Stabilize Motion feature to stabilize the footage using the sprocket hole. The difference is not important. And that's good. That means the original material is not bad at all. If you pay attention to the film that was stabilized in After Effects, the frame remains in the same place and the gate around the image appears to move, contrary to the original material. I noticed the stabilized footage lost some sharpness. Everything comes with a price tag. The images I'm getting with this setup have more resolution in the vertical direction than 1080p, but less than 2K. The good part is the image doesn't look plasticky like those extremely compressed films scanned with the Wolverine or similar systems. On the other hand, the possibilities in regards of color and exposure correction are much more extensive. Capturing raw images allows the user to correct and grade color to a greater extent without artifacts. The image is not the best, but there is a Panasonic GH7 in the market already. I wish I could say the GH3 is a good still photography camera, but it is not. I used it to take some pictures the other day 
and the images were not good at all. But the GH3, or a newer camera of the same line, is ideal for this job. At some point during the process of making this experiment that lasted one year, I got a Nikon 60mm macro lens. I was expecting to see a major improvement, but that was not the case. The Nikon lens creates a better image, but the difference is not important. Now, the Nikon lens is newer than the other lens I used, but this Nikkor lens was introduced back in 1989. The question is, can a real modern macro lens and a newer camera create a much better image? I think so. I'm not exactly interested in scanning Super 8 film at home, but if you are, you can get some ideas from this video. I just enjoy tinkering and figuring things out. I could apply this information in the future to modify a 16mm projector. That would be great. 16mm has three times more information than Super 8. That would make everything easier and the results better. The image could fill the sensor of the camera, effectively increasing the resolution of the scanned images to at least 4K. Thanks for watching the Cinematography Lab.